السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Uh, I guess before I get started, you know, I, some things that I said after Juma I will repeat. Um, you know, we're here to honor Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So when he is being spoken about, our attention should be. You know, on what's being said. You know, meeting, greeting, all of that either comes before or after. Uh, you know, no one else should be speaking. Uh, you know, children are children, and that's sometimes understandable. But um, you know, adults shouldn't. Again, you know that that old saying that everything I needed to know in life I learned in kindergarten. Uh, you know, one of those things that we learned, that we were supposed to have learned in kindergarten was that, you know, when, you know, when you come to class or when you, when you're listen, or when you, when someone is speaking, then you listen. Uh, you know, because a lot of people, they say, well, I don't remember what you said. Well, they don't remember what I said because they're busy doing something else. So, you know, again, you know, we're here to honor Rasulullah so listening to about him uh, is part of that. Uh, and it's very disrespectful to him when somebody is speaking about him and we're engaged in something else. Uh, so, inshallah, I'll get started. نحمده ونصلي على رسول النبي الكريم أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين يحدنا السراط المستقيم سراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين آمين قال الله تعالى في شان حبيبي إن الله وملائكته يسلون على النبي يا أيها الذين آمنوا سلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما اللهم صل وسلم بارك على سيدنا مولانا محمد طب القلوب ودوائها وعافية الأبدان وشفائها ونور الأبصار وديائها وعلى آله وصحبه دائما أبدا صلاة وسلاما عليك يا سيدي يا رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم. I'm still looking for a mic where I don't have to hold it all the time because when I put it down here, then there's a big difference in the voice. Uh, but when we look at the Quran. We read the Qur'an, multiple places in the Qur'an. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is challenging us, you know, to observe and to look and to ponder and, and contemplate everything around us. You know, which is why, you know, it's very interesting. If you look at all the basic sciences, they all have their roots with Muslim scholars who weren't just scholar, Muslim scholars, you know, because they were Muslim and they were a scholar of, of that field, but they were scholars of the religion. And then through that extension came you know, all the other sciences, you know, whether it's chemistry or physics or mathematics, uh, you know, biology or all the others. You know, it's interesting that, you know, people talk about the theory of evolution you know, like it's something new that Darwin came up with. You know, there's a Muslim scholar who wrote about it a thousand years before that. You know, and if you look at Darwin's wording, it's almost the exact same wording that this scholar used. The big difference is that Darwin uh, took God out of the picture, where the Muslim scholar is talking about how all of these things Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created within the system. 
But the Quran is also the only book that challenges you that if you have an issue with it, if you don't accept it, then do this and disprove it. You know, most other religious texts will tell you just believe this. Whereas in the Quran, in various places, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He says, أَفَلَا يَتَدَبَّرُونَ Quran." That do you not ponder over the Quran? You know, it's a rhetorical question, meaning you should be pondering over the Quran. Why don't you ponder over the Quran? Unfortunately, most of us, when we think of the Quran, all we think about is the text. You know, the book. You know, which is Quran is Samit. It is the silent Quran. You know, that's the only place our mind goes. We, we, we forget about the Qur'an in Atiq. The talking, living, breathing Qur'an. You know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, قَدْ جَاءَكُمْ مِنَ اللَّهِ نُورٌ وَكِتَابٌ مُّبِينٌ That for sure I have sent the light and the manifest book. Man of this book, of course, the Quran, but the light here we know is Rasulullah, sallallahu alaihi wasallam, through which we are to read the Quran. You know, you can't read something if there's no light. You can't even see the words. So the word or the light through which we are to read the Quran is Rasulullah sallam himself, and he himself is not only that light, but he is the Quran, and he is the explanation to the Quran. He is Quran and Natiq, the living, talking, breathing Quran that we can see. There is a understanding of Rasulullah which transcends all the various ideologies within the Muslims. Or not really an understanding, but a statement regarding Rasulullah. Wasallam, that transcends all the various ideologies, you know, whether it's the various Khawarij on one extreme, like the Salafis, the Wahhabis, the Deobandis, you know, or, you know, the various Shia groups, which are, you know, like the Razis and the Zaydis, or even the ones that the Shias themselves don't accept, like the Ismailis, or those who claim to be al Sunnah wal Jamaat, and even those who have infiltrated it as the Nasabis. So if you look at all of them, all of them say that Rasulullah is khair khalqillah. That he is the best creation of Allah. No one disputes this. Everyone acknowledges this. That of course is where the controversy ends. You know, so this is my non-controversial speech, where this is where that speech ends. As I said in Juma yesterday, you know, it doesn't matter what you say, so there's always going to be somebody who's going to dispute it. And anything you say, there will always be somebody who's going to dispute it. Period. I mean, that's just the nature of the world we live in, the nature of, of uh, mankind. So as I said, you know, this is where the speech ends, and now I'm just going to ponder out loud. When I look at this statement of khayr khalqillah, the best creation of Allah, questions come to mind. You know, he is the best creation of Allah, but for what aspect of creation? What characteristics are the best? Is he limited in those characteristics that are best? And then the other question comes that when was he or is he the best creation of Allah? Is there a lim time limitation upon that? So if I look at the statement itself, you know, there is no specification within the statement. 
The statement isn't specified that he's the best for this and this and this. And there also are also no exceptions to the statement that he is the best except this, this, or that. You know, I mean, if we look at like the kalima, and we start off with la ilaha, the statement is that there is absolutely nothing that deserves to be worshipped. Nothing exists that, there, that deserves to be worshipped. And then we say illallah, except Allah. So the meaning of the statement is that only Allah is the one who deserves to be worshipped. But here, khayr khalqillah, the best creation of Allah, there is no exception that he's the best except this. Which tells me that this is a very general statement that covers every aspect of his being. That he is the best in everything. But when I say this, now then I think that, well, somebody would say that, well, is he best at lying? Or is he the best at <coughs> stealing? But if I look at language itself, you know, the, the statement is khair, good, best. Khair khal, creation, Allah of Allah. In language, if I talk about a thief, and I talk about somebody who excels at thievery or stealing, then I don't say that he is the best thief. Then I say he's the worst thief. You know, if I talk about a liar, then somebody who excels in lying, you know, pathological liars, I don't say, oh, he's the best liar. He's the worst. So anything bad, if someone excels in it, he's not the best, he's the worst. So simple part of the statement, khayr khalqillah, the best of the creation of Allah, means that implies or, or means right off the bat that this is talking about everything that is good. Of course, how do we know what is good other than we look at Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Because he is the definition of good. So here, when I start analyzing this, you know, looking at it and just kind of focusing on, on this aspect of it, okay, every aspect of him, of his being. You know, if I look at his beauty, as we've talked about before, anyone who saw ever saw him said that they were in awe of him. doesn't matter whether this was someone who accepted him or didn't accept him. Anyone who ever saw him or described him said that they had never seen anyone more beautiful than him. To the extent that when Aisha Siddiqa, radiallana, his wife was asked about his beauty, what did she say? She said that if the friends of Zulekha, you know, Zulekha was the wife of Aziz and Misr, the, the leader of, one of the leaders of Egypt, who was trying to seduce Yusuf or Joseph, peace be upon him. And she says, so if the friends of Zulaikha had seen Rasulullah in the place of Yusuf, they would have cut their hearts instead of their hands. We know from the Quran that when you know she tries to seduce Yusuf al Islam, and then all the women of, of Egypt are talking that oh, you know, she's trying to seduce this slave. What type of woman is this? You know, she's got such a great position. Why is she falling, you know, for this slave? for the servant of the house. So what did she do? She invited them all for, for dinner or lunch or, or whatever, for food. And she has Yusuf al-Islam stand behind a curtain. And she gives them all fruits and a knife. And as they're cutting the fruit, she removes the curtain. And as they're cutting the, the fruits, they cut their hands without even realizing it. You know, when you're in awe of something you know, so beautiful, you forget yourself. It becomes a great anesthetic. 
You don't even realize what's going on. And so they cut their hands and all they're saying is مَا هَذَا بَشَرَةً إِنْ هَذَا مَلَكٌ كَرِيمٌ you know, that this is not human. This, this is not some human. This must be some angel, you know, from above. Because they were, they were so in awe of his beauty, so they cut the hands. Yes, Aisha. Yet Aisha Siddiq, she says that if the friends, the friends of Zulaikha had seen Rasulullah in his place, in the place of Yusuf al-Islam, they wouldn't have cut their hands. They would have cut their harps. You know, and I can give many more examples of his beauty. His, you know, just the physical beauty. You know, but, you know, people get tired and uh, time gets long. Uh, and unfortunately, when we talk about these things, time gets extra long. You know. When we look at the beauty of his, his or rather his physical strength, There was a wrestler in Makkah called Rukana. And it was said about him that he could fight a thousand men and defeat a thousand men at once. And of course, this is exaggeration, but this is, you know, it just, it tells you how strong this man is. Very powerful. No one in Makkah could beat him. And so one day, you know, he's passing by Rasulullah, so somebody challenges the Rasulullah, so somebody. He says that if you can beat me in wrestling, then I will accept you. And the other thing was that if you beat me, you know, he wanted to challenge him over a hundred sheep. The Rasulullah accepted his challenge. And as soon as they start, Rukana finds himself on his back. And initially he says, oh, you know, I slipped. This had never happened to him, but he, you know, he said, oh, I slipped. So Rasulullah says, says fine. Yeah. Let's go again. And the same thing. And then he again, he says, oh, you know, I, I, I slipped again. So then the third time and finally he realized, oh, you know, this is something real. Sayyidina Ali, Karam al you know, who is well known for his strength. He is the conqueror of Khaybar. And during the battle, he used the gate of Khaybar as his shield. You know, he ripped the gate off its hinges and used that as his shield. And at the end of, and at the, end of the battle, he threw the shield, this, this gate behind his back, over his head, like this. And he said it landed like 80 feet over. It took 70 men to pick up the gate. Same thing. When Ali asked Rasulullah, is there anyone who can defeat me? And Rasulullah said, meet, meet, meet so and so in such a place. Meet a man, he'll come to you, he'll be masked, and you meet him, meet him in such a place. And the same thing happens. You know. They wrestle immediately, Ali Radhan finds himself on his back and when the Rasulullah pulls off his mask, it's him. Physical beauty, physical strength. No one matches him. We look at his knowledge He challenges his, he challenged it, challenged the Arabs, you know, when they were asking what happened is that one day, you know, he's in the masjid and people are asking him questions. And they start asking questions that will get themselves in trouble. You know, we have this tendency when it comes to religion that we want to ask certain things that will get ourselves in trouble, like the people of Bani Israel, the children of Israel in Surah Baqarah, the first or the second surah, where when they were ordered to slaughter the cow. You know, and then they wanted to know what color it was and how old it was and this and this and this. And then when they finally specified this is the one that they had to slaughter, they said, oh, well, we don't want to slaughter this one. You know, before they could have grabbed any cow and slaughtered it and it would have fulfilled the order or the command. 
So they were asking him questions that would have gotten themselves in trouble. And so then he stands up and he says that, Ask me anything from today until Qiyamah, until the day of judgment, and I will answer you. One of them asked who was his father. And Rasulullah immediately told him who his actual father was because there was a dispute as to his, who his real father was. A hypocrite stands up and asks, where will my end be? And he says, the fire. You know, because he's thinking, oh, you know, I'm going to ask him. He doesn't even know that I'm not a Muslim and I'm stand, sitting here in front of him. In the Battle of Badr, or before the Battle of Badr, he told his followers exactly where the lead, these leaders of Quraysh would fall. Fourteen of them he named by name and says, so and so will fall here, so and so will fall here, so and so will fall here. Abdullah ibn Masood says, later on I went and I looked, and they didn't fall an inch this way or that way. Exactly where Rasulullah has said they would fall, that's where they fell. Allah SWT says in the Quran, Alim al Ghaib fala yudhir ala ghaibihi ahada. Referring to himself, Alim al Ghaib, Allah is the knower of the unseen. And he does not give this knowledge to anyone. And then he says, Illa manir tadamir rasulin, except for the messenger whom he has chosen. Which of course is Rasulullah. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. You know, all of these things that, that he said would happen are happening in front of us now. And we see all of these things. And of course, Rasulullah is the city of knowledge. And yet, Ali is the door to that city. So the door to the city, Babul Madina to Ilm, Ali he said the time will come when people will be scared to shake hands with each other. So when the door has this much knowledge, what can the, what can we say about the city? We look at his authority. Allah Subhanahu in the Quran he says that whatever he gives take and whatever he stops you from refrain from it. Complete authority. To the extent that that authority, Allah Subhanahu wa says, what? وَمَا يَنْتُقَ عَنِ الْهَوَى إِنْ هُوَ إِلَّا وَحْيٌ يُوهَى That he does not say anything from, him, from his own nafs, from his own self, but everything he says is nothing except revelation. So everything he says is nothing except what Allah Subhanahu wa loves for him to say. This is his authority. That's the verbal authority. Now we look at the physical authority. Allah Subhanahu wa says, وَمَا رَمَيْتَ وَإِذْ رَمَيْتَ وَلَكِنَّ اللَّهَ رَمَى You know, during the Battle of Badr, when he threw the pebbles, and it hit every one of the disbelievers, never touched any of the believers, Allah Subhanahu wa says what? He says that it was, you know, it was not you who threw when you threw, but it was Allah who threw. So even his doing, Allah Subhanahu wa says, it's not your doing, it's my doing. You know, this is that connection of love between Allah and His Messenger, sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Allah Subhanahu You know, we go on, you know, every aspect of his being, you know, his character, you know, his honesty, you know, and if you want to look at his character, you know, it's like when, when uh, the son of Imam Ahmad bin Hanbal, Abdullah, his son, asked him about Ali. 
And he said, in order to understand the status of Ali, all you have to understand is that Ali had many enemies. Not just one or two, but he had many. At that time, hundreds of thousands of enemies. And yet none of them could produce anything against him. When we look at the character of Rasulullah Sallallahu he had many enemies. All of Quraysh was his enemy. All of Arabia was his enemy. Qisra, the Persian emperor, was his enemy. Superpower of the time. Qaisar, the Roman emperor, was his enemy. And all of them colluded together against him. And yet none of them could produce anything that they could say that, oh, look at this, what you did, at your character. To the extent that Abu Sufyan, when Abu Sufyan was in the court of Qaisar, you know, Heraclius, the, Ro the Byzantian emperor of the time, and he asked him, he says that, he's, has he ever been known to tell a lie? Abu Sufyan, who was his sworn enemy at that time, who was the one who brought the, the, the or convinced the Quraysh to bring the army against him in Badr, he, brought, he personally brought the army against him in Uhud, personally united the forces against him in, in Khandaq. Even he has to say that, no, he has never told a lie. We look at his mercy. I mean, you know, we look at how he dealt with people, how he dealt with everybody in society. You know, it's interesting. You know, we were talking about this again yesterday. You know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says, لَقَدْ مَنَّ اللَّهُ عَلَى الْمُؤْمِنِينَ إِذْ بَعْثَ فِيهِمْ رَسُولًا And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has done this great favor upon the believers. And he has sent, you know, a messenger from amongst themselves. And actually, the real <coughs> meaning is that he has sent this messenger uh, to them like their own, as their own lives. In Surah Rahman, you know, when he mentions the fire and the punishment, he also asks, Because that reminds some people to do the right thing. When he mentions paradise, he also says, Now, which of the favors of your Lord do you deny? Because some people, they do what they're supposed to do, you know, because they're eager to attain that <laughs> blessing. So Rasulullah Sallallahu is sent both as Nazir, as a warner, as well as as Bashir, as a giver of glad tidings. Both of these are aspects of his mercy. When I look at the other, and you know, and we can go on and on about, you know, all of his or various attributes of his. But then the question comes, you know, as I said before, you know, when I'm looking at this statement, khayr khal khilla. You know, because you know, everybody, as I said, everybody acknowledges this statement, but then they want to question his knowledge. You know, because, you know, if I look at that hadith or that narration, which is in Sayyid Muslim, where Rasulullah says, ask me any question. You know, somebody could have stood up and asked that in 2020, who all will be at the Islamic Community Center in Griffin, you know, on November the 14th at 8 p.m.? That's a question. And he said, ask me anything. 
between now and the day of judgment. So this is between then and the day of judgment. So somebody could have asked that question. And the fact that Rasulullah said, ask me, tells us that he knew the answer to that question. And yet you have people who say, well, he didn't know this or he didn't know that. And there may be something he didn't know, but I don't know that. Meaning that there's no question that I can think of that he didn't know the answer to. Whether he was allowed to give the answer to that is a different, que this is a different issue. If I look at, you know, like the day of judgment, when will the day of judgment be? He didn't tell us exactly. He told us today it would be a Monday. Or Juma. He told us Juma. He said Friday. He told us the time that it will be after Asr, between Asr and Maghrib. He told us the date. It will be the tenth of Muharram. He didn't tell us the year. So he knows all of this, and he knows exactly what's going to happen right before that. Right? Because he said, okay, this will happen, this will happen, this will happen, all of these things. That we see all of these things happening today. And throughout history, they've all happened. Whatever he said, okay, this will happen. And we see that. You know, he talked about shoes that would talk. And Nike has shoes that will tell you how many steps you've taken in all of these things. He talked about people keeping uh, watch over their families from their hip. The man would leave the household and he would keep in touch with the family or know what's going on in the household from his hip. Where do most people wear their phones? On their hips. He talked about buildings in Mecca that would, that would stretch above the mountains. The largest clock tower in the world is where? In Mecca. And it stretches above the mountains. And he's telling this to, to people. I mean, what was the need for him to tell these things to the people? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is having, them, having him tell them so that we would know. You know, all of these things that he told us. You know, again, you know, you start looking at all of the prophecies. And these aren't prophecies that, you know, just got written recently. You know, these are prophecies, prophecies that were written in books, you know, 13, 1400 years ago. That Rasulullah Sallallahu said this. And well documented that yes, he said this. And again, but he didn't tell us the date because he wasn't allowed to tell us the date. Because then human nature would be, oh, I'm just going to wait till that date. The problem is my end, my day of judgment begins when I die. <coughs> If I become complacent between now and then, and I die before then, before I think, oh, it's time for me to straighten up, well, it's too late. But coming to the other aspect of, of you know, when I look at, when I try to analyze Khair Khalfanda, is when does this apply? From when to when? And again, if I look at the statement itself, there is no specification on it, which means that it's open-ended. From the time he was created to the time there will be no other, no creation left. And then when everything will be created again, In Islam, we, all, we believe in the last day, and we believe in the day of judgment. You know, some people try to mix the two, but they're not the same. The last day is when everything will be destroyed, 
and then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will raise us up again for the judgment. So he is the best of the creation from the time of his creation until there will be no more creation. And then again when everything will be created again, he will still be the best of creation. Which is also why it's important to understand because people, they, they, they question this, okay, well why is it so important to know that he is the first creation? Because one is that he is a witness to all of creation, which in itself tells us that he's the first creation, because if he's a witness to all of creation, he has to be created before the rest of creation. Yet he is creation, he is not God. And then, so then uh, that also tells us that he is the best of creation from the beginning. And, even, and everything created after him is created for him. Any questions to this point? I've been perfectly clear. No questions. Inshallah. You know, but you know, again, when we look at at, at his being, you know, we look at, at the description Umma Ma'abad gave, uh, which is interesting because she 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 met him once and gave this description. Uh, she met him, and the way she met him is that Rasulullah was, when he was immigrating from Mecca to Medina Munawwah. Uh, and on the way, they run out of food. He's with Abu Bakr, his friend, and then the guide and Amr ibn Fuhaira, who was one of the servants of Abu Bakr. So these four are traveling and they run out of food. And they see this tent at the distance. And so Abu Bakr and Rasulullah they go. And there's this old woman there. And, and the, the Arabs were very, are still very hospitable people. You know, if they find a guest, you know, they're just overwhelmed with, with uh, serving the guest. And so when they, when they meet her, they ask her, do you have anything for us to eat? And she says, we have nothing. She says, my husband has left, you know, to go find some food and work uh, along with her son. And she says, we have nothing, you know, except for this old goat. It had a goat that was skin and bones because it hadn't eaten, eaten either. It was old. And she course, you know, wasn't giving any milk. And so Rasulullah he asked her, he said, uh, may I milk her? And she says, well, you know, it's, it's, it's dried up. I mean, uh, this goat, she, she's old and, and weak and hadn't eaten in a while and there's no milk. She said, well, you know, if you give me permission, at least let me try. So she says, fine, you know, if you want to, I mean, you know, Nothing's going to happen. I don't think anything's going to happen, but, you know, if you want to. So Rasulullah goes to the goat, and he places his hand on, on the back of the goat's back half. And then he asks for a bowl, and they bring him a bowl, and he starts to milk the goat. And the bowl is full, and, and they ask for a bigger pot. And the whole pot is overflowing with, with and the description is that there's there's foam on top, you know, which means that that's a high protein milk, you know, it's it's high quality milk, you know, that's what the foam is. And then you know, Rasulullah has everybody drink and he drinks and there's still plenty left. And then she leaves, or I mean, and then Rasulullah leaves. They continue on their journey. 
you know, her husband comes back and he sees, you know, the goat looks healthy now. What happened? And there's all this milk in the house. Where did this come from? And so she tells him, she says, you know, this man came and, and this is what happened and this is what he did. And her husband says, describe him for me. And so she starts describing him. And, you know, and in the description, she says that I'd never seen anyone like him. You know, and, and I was just in awe of him, and anyone who saw him was in awe of him. And he was neither too tall nor too short. You know, his head wasn't too big or too small. When he walked, he walked with purpose. And when he spoke, he spoke with purpose. You know, not like us, we just talk. And when he was silent, it was just, you know, uh, just a beautiful thing. And when he spoke, you know, the words just kind of, uh, they flowed like, like pearls. And she gives this lengthy description of him. And she says that he was, he was as beautiful up close as he was from afar. And I mean, if you look at that statement in itself, you know, uh, that also implies that even from history, and we see this, you know, those of his contemporaries couldn't find any issues with him, any faults with him. And even if you look throughout history, no one has been able to come up with anything. You know, those who, who bark at him, that's all they do is they bark. They come up with stuff that they themselves have pulled out of their pockets. Nothing with any legitimacy <laughs> against him. And so, after she described him, her husband says to her that this must be the man that Quraysh is after. You know, because Quraysh had put a bounty on him. You know, a hundred camels, dead or alive. So this must be the man that Quraysh is after. And if I had met him, I would have accepted him. And she says, well, I already did. And I beat you to it. So all of these aspects of Rasulullah so, so, you know, everything is nothing but perfection. And, you know, I don't know there, there are a lot of things that can be said. Uh, but, you know, if we understand this much, you know, I think that's plenty. But at the same time, we must also understand, when I started off, you know, I said that that part of the, the, of the talk was the non-controversial part as far as, you know, those who, who are supposed to be Muslim. You know, pretty much everything I've said after that is disputed. You know, people try to challenge his knowledge. They try to challenge his authority. They say, oh, he didn't know what was on the other side of the wall. Some of them even say that he didn't have the authority to break a, a twig in two. Now, these are literal statements that people make. So-called scholars have made. And then when you say, well, if you accept him as a khayr khayr khayr, then how can you say this? Well, you know, yeah, but then they come up with a different explanation. But again, the issue is pondering. That's why Allah SWT has challenged us to ponder and to think. Most of us, oh, you know, we hear this guy and one, oh, this is the path I'm going to take. And then, you know, the other, next time someone else says something else, oh, yeah, I like this too, so I'm going to go this way. I mean, without thinking. There's no reflection. And this is why we're in the condition we are in. You know, Ali despised this. Because during time, his Khilafah, you know, a certain group would come and everybody, oh, let's give allegiance to this guy. And then the Ali Radiyallahu's people would come, oh, let's give allegiance to this guy. And then somebody else, oh, let's give allegiance to him. Ali Radiyallahu says, you know, what are you? you know, make up your minds. Which side of the, of the line do you want to be on? You know, and again, we look at the events of, of today. 
you know, what's going on today, and this is what we see the people doing. Just because somebody, you know, looks nice and, you know, has, you know, is standing on some pulpit and saying, oh, you know, he must be right. Without thinking of what he just said. Without analyzing, you know, anything that he just said. You know, it's like, you know, and, and their scholars tell you. You know, I was listening to one of them. He said, oh, you know, there's no tadabbur in Islam. We simply obey Allah and His Messenger. Whatever Allah and His Messenger say, we accept it. You know, and this is where Ali Radewa said, Kalamatul Haq wa yuridul batil. That the statement is true, but what he's inferring from it is falsehood. And so when we look at, you know, our condition today, this is what it is. That anybody starts talking and without even thinking, we're, we're agreeing. Without realizing that we just agree to something that belittles the honor and the status of Rasulullah. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And from that, you know, once, once you go down that hill, once we go down that hill, it's, you know, it's a slippery slope that you can't get out of. So anything anybody says, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala afala yatadabbaroon al-Qur'an, that if, we, you know, if he's ordering us to ponder over the Qur'an, then we need to be pondering over everything else too. I mean, if the Qur'an, in which there is no doubt, ذَلِكَ الْكِتَابُ لَا رَيْبَ فِي هُدًا لِلْمُتَّقِينَ You know, this is a book in which there is no doubt. So if in that book Allah subhanahu wa is telling us to ponder over that book where there is no doubt, then if somebody else is saying something, I definitely need to be pondering over that and saying, okay, let's see what, let's see what he's really saying. Let me analyze this. And does this conform to the basis of what we know? So if everybody acknowledges Rasulullah that he is the best creation of Allah and then he wants to challenge the knowledge or challenge his authority or challenge any other aspect of his being then obviously he does not know what he's saying. And if I follow that then I don't know what I'm doing. May Allah help us. You know, and again, you know, the help of Allah comes, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that I will not change the condition of a nation unless they change their own condition. And people say, oh, you know, this was a big thing when I was in college. You know, because college students are where revolutions start. You know, because you have, you know, a bunch of guys running around who have no wisdom think, thinking, oh, we got to do something. Let me do something. So it's easy to lead them like sheep. So, you know, it was a big thing when I was in college, you know, among the Muslim Student Association, you know, guys would stand up, oh, see, Allah subhanahu wa says that he won't change our condition until we change our condition ourselves. So we need to be, you know, uh, you know, becoming engineers and this and this and that so we can change the condition. And that's not what it's talking about. Allah subhanahu wa says, otherwise, then what is Allah changing? If you've already changed it, what's he changing? What it's talking about is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala won't change our exterior condition. You know, when we look at the Muslim world, we look at all of this. You know, even though, you know, you have some countries that are the richest countries in the world, and then you have such poverty. You have countries that, that you know, you know, guys are, are having a, a, a golden commode. And yet, who respects them? They have no respect. Because they themselves have no honor. 
Because in order to have honor yourself, you have to honor Rasulullah. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Hmm? <coughs> but what it's talking about is that if you can that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala won't change your exterior condition until you change what's inside of you. Your intern, your inside, your heart. When you fill that with the love of Allah and His Messenger, then a small group can easily defeat the superpowers of the time. And we've seen that. He's shown us that, yet we continue to ignore it. You know, in the Quran, he's talking about this repeatedly, where he's showing us the stories of Musa alayhi salam. You know, and the various other prophets. So, I'm going to end here, unless somebody has a question. So, inshallah, you know, may Allah subhanahu wa allow us to understand this, uh, and if there is good in it, to apply it. Uh, may allow us to fulfill his command to ponder uh, over his, his book, and over the one that he sent as the explanation and the manifestation of his book. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And may he fill us, fill our hearts with his true love and the true love of his beloved Prophet Muhammad. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, his family, his companions. Well, one thing I should say before I truly end, to make this a true molad, milad. And we've, talk, we've been talking about this Fridays, but that's why I didn't start going over this. When we look at his birth, his birth is also the best birth. Mm -hmm. And when we look at his passing, his passing is also the best passing. When we look at the aspects of his birth, yeah. all of those, you know, the signs that were given to, to all of the world and to all of the universe, you know, and this is why we commemorate his birth, because you can't you can't discuss somebody's life without their birth. And you can't say, "Oh, I'm going to talk about so and so's history." Well, you got to start with the birth. And the interesting thing is that if we understand the birth of Rasulullah so Salam, then we don't need then that gives us the ability to understand everything else. You know, we start analyzing his birth. And the statements of his, his mother, the statements of the women that were there when he was born. All of the things that happened, you know, in, in, in Persia and, and in, in Byzantium, you know, where Allah SWT sent warning signs that my messenger has come. Now this is something he did with, with the prophets, all the prophets, but he did those locally. You know, if we look at the birth of Moses, peace be upon him, or we look at the birth of Jesus, peace be upon him, or we look at the birth of various other prophets, he is, you know, all of them, you know, he sent signs <coughs> so people knew, oh, something special has happened. When we look at the birth of Rasulullah, the whole world knew, the whole universe knew, oh, something major, something special has happened. The angels in the heavens, the jinn, the mankind, mankind, all of the animals, everything that was created knew. Because they all saw the, saw the signs. You know, and as I was saying in fr on Friday, you know, it's na natural to follow someone better than you. Rasulullah is khair khalqillah, but he, he is the best creation of Allah and he is the best over everything. So if I'm a doctor, then he is also my prophet. And we see how he healed people. And today, even today, West, if we look at Eastern medicine, many of the uh, uh, practitioners of Eastern medicine are basing their practices off of things that he said. of things to use for various illnesses. 
If I'm an astronaut, then he is also my prophet. You know, astronauts, they go into space, they have to wear all this stuff. Rasulullah when he went to the heavens and beyond, he just went in the Miraj. Something we'll talk about more, you know, when time comes, inshallah. You know, if you're a teacher, he's also your prophet. And he is the best of teachers. If you're a student, he's also your prophet. He is the best of students, because his teacher is his Lord. If you're a businessman, he's your prophet. And he is the one who conducted business the best, with complete honesty. If you're a farmer, he's your prophet. You know, the 300 date trees that he planted to free Salman Farsi from slavery, which grew so fast that in one year they were already giving fruit. And he planted them from seed. Normally it would take at least five years to get fruit. So it doesn't matter what you are. If it's something decent, then he's your prophet. And he is the example that you should be following. Because he is the best at it. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala again help us and, and fill our hearts with his true love. And the true love of his beloved Prophet Muhammad, sallallahu alaihi wasallam, his family, his companions, and all of those whom they love, inshallah.